All right, friends. Good to see you. Good to see you all. Come on in. Come on in. There's one more spot left. We won't center you out. Okay. Well, we need some more seats. So pause. Pause. Come on in. Come on in. I'll pass them over to here. Voila. Okay, yeah, we'll pull all these out. All right. Now we're good. Welcome, everybody. I had no idea that all of you were so passionate about the book of Acts. <laughs> also, somebody's leaving or something. Or, yeah. I don't know, whatever. Uh, Quincy, can you pray for us? Yeah. Like, you're still on the clock, bro. So. <laughs> <laughs> what a jack. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, you're not getting rid of me. times to be able to be together, to learn together, to be encouraged, to, um, to be inspired, and um, maybe be sparked to good work. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, God, as we hear, hear your word, we pray that you would um, allow it to penetrate our hearts and um, yeah, continue the transformation in our lives that we can be just a little bit more like your son, Jesus. So uh, bless our time. Bless the words from our dear brother, Jimmy, as he's prepared and um, that there would be something good for us um, to take out of this place, not just for us to be you know, nod heads and say this was good, but that we would actually be changed and transformed. That's our, that's our prayer for today. So we thank you in advance for all the work that you're going to do. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so for those of you who maybe haven't been here in a minute or haven't ever been here, um, this is the pre-recording that serves as the teaching for all of our sites. Um, and so uh, it's a little bit of a different vibe, but if there's any, at any point you want to stop me or clarify or any, uh, anything, feel free. Um, I have learned so much through this uh, section of scripture. So we're in part two, this isn't part of the recording yet, so you can say whatever you want. Um, oh, uh, phone's off and on silent. If you have any loose change, let's make sure it's unloose change. Just saying. Uh, good timing. Come on in, come on in. You're good, you're good. The buses will wait. Do we have more seats, possibly? There's one up here. David, yes, bro. Get up here, right here. No, come on. <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. Hey. Um, so yeah, if, if there's anything that you want to stop me at, if, if it's really, I don't say this tongue in cheek, but kind of like impactful that you're like, whoa, clarifying point there. That's totally fine. Otherwise we will have opportunity at the end for uh, Q and A. Uh, and then we'll get into our sh shared meal together. For those of you that are joining us online. Yep, you are. Um, welcome, glad you're here. We're jumping into really season two of our um, walk through the book of Acts. So we've done the first 10 chapters and over the, the next number of weeks, we're gonna do the next 10 chapters. So. This is such an interesting section of scripture. I think I've, I've read through the book of Acts a number of times, like many of us have. How many of you have ever read through, cover to cover, chapter to chapter, chapter-ish, uh, the book of Acts? Yeah. Have you read through the book of Acts or any of the gospels where you're like, holy smokes, I never saw that before? Yeah, a few of us. That was my experience over the last two, okay. We're not even in the sermon. All right. 
So we're going to jump in, uh, save your questions for the end, or if you want to interject, you totally can. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be really good. All right, Luke, we good? Okay, I'll count down from five, five, and then we'll uh, we'll get going. Okay, my friends, the book of Acts. If you remember nothing else from the teaching today, whether you're joining us at one of our sites online or here in the room, if you remember nothing else from this sermon, remember this, the gospel is good news. The gospel goes and the gospel is grace. Let me repeat that. The gospel is good news. This message that we follow, that we remember and that we share is good news news, not bad, not negative, not judgmental, not pejorative. The gospel is good news. And the gospel was always meant to go somewhere. And the gospel includes by its grace. The gospel is good news. It goes and is grace. So welcome back to the book of Acts. Can I get an amen? Amen. Yes, from one of our sites. In fact, turn around to somebody that you didn't come with. Give them a a fist bump and say, we are back in Acts. Even at our sites, turn to somebody that you didn't come with. Give them a fist bump and say, we are back in Acts. All right, that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Okay, so the book of Acts is a fascinating one. The book of Acts is the second part of a two-part volume that the author Luke, who's a traveling companion of Paul, a scribe and historian and a physician, is compiling to tell the story of the gospel of Jesus. What did he teach? What did he do? And what was the impact? And then the Acts of the Apostles, or as it's better um, described and translated, like the actual uh, Greek translation of the Acts of the Apostles. If you look at um, the heading in your Bible or if you're using a study Bible, it either says the Acts or the Acts of the Apostle. A better description is the Acts of the Spirit through the Apostles to form the church. The Acts of the Spirit through the Apostles to form the church. Um, And it is a roller coaster ride. Uh, Luke has a particular aim in his um, biographical sketch of Jesus, which is that this is for the Gentiles. This is for the outsiders. The church will take shape, the spirit will inform and dwell within these people that have always felt ostracized out and confused by the rules and uh, rituals that don't always lead to relationship of religion. Now, um, this is also a two-part volume and that we are coming to part two, series two, um, right now for the next number of weeks. We started this series uh, back last year in the fall of 2023 in October, where we walked through the first 10 chapters. Now, if you have time, I would strongly recommend, uh, whether you're here in the room or you're at one of our sites, go back and watch. I'm so proud of our teaching team's um, effort as we walked through it. But I'm also gonna assume that not all of us have been able to watch it or maybe you forget. So I am going to take us through 10 chapters of Acts in three minutes. You ready? 10 chapters of Acts in three minutes. Can somebody count me down from five? Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Okay, chapter one and two. Um, It's the ascension of Jesus and the last mission that he leaves the disciples with. So they are gathered um, together and they're wondering what they're supposed to do. Jesus appears to them and says, you will be overcome with the power of the spirit and you will do something for now, wait here. He ascends and then they participate in chapter two in this uh, Pentecost, this feast of Pentecost where hundreds of thousands of Jews are coming for this annual festival and the spirit falls upon them and empowers them to communicate the message and to have the message dwell within. They are the new temples and this takes place not in the this, this synagogue, sanctuary, temple that all of the Jews were typically gathered at. It takes place in them down a side street at a house, chapter two. Chapter three and four, um, James and John go to the temple and uh, there's a lame man there that's poor, asks for money. They can't give him anything, but they actually give him the means to eternal life through physical healing. The religious leaders, the Jewish establish- establishment are absolutely dumbfounded by this and they, they press the apostles and say like, what, what are you doing? You shouldn't do this. Stop talking about uh, Jesus in the temple and Jerusalem and they do it anyway. They don't message because they don't listen because who can stop God's messages? The, the disciples then continue their plan of allocating resources because this is not a, just a, a gospel of philosophy. It's a gospel of doing, of caring, of serving. And so they start to pool resources. And this is where we first hear of Barnabas, who's the great encourager who sells the field and gives the proceeds to the people so that they can continue to mobilize the mission. Chapter five, the opposite happens. We hear about the story of Ananias and Sapphira, these people who who also sell a field, but keep a portion to themselves. They lie to the Holy Spirit and 
and they are struck dead. They die, both the husband and the wife, in great fear grips the community, and yet the mission continues. The apostles are then captured by the Jewish leaders. They're put in public jail for the first time, and for the first time, an angel of the Lord sets them free. Remember this because it'll be a recurring frame, uh, um, a theme throughout the uh, all of the writing of Acts. They're flogged and whipped and then they, they're let go with the message that don't, don't talk about this anymore and they don't listen. They continue to mature as a movement to put together different teams for prayer and teaching and then they elect a deacon's board, those who will serve and care. And here's where Stephen comes into the picture. He's a leader, a deacon, a server, a caregiver, helps to prepare the meals for the poor. In chapter seven, Stephen is at, uh, invited to a debate that doesn't go well and eventually he is uh, judged and stoned. He's killed at the behest of an oversight of Saul, soon to be known as Paul. Chapter nine, Saul changes his tune after having a life altering Damascus Road experience where Jesus comes to him and doesn't say, I'm going to rebuke you and kill you. He says, why do you persecute me? Why are you persecuting me? Paul is taken aback by this. He's taken in by the disciples, unknown disciples, unnamed, with some reservation, and then ends up meeting back with the apostles in Jerusalem eventually, and Barnabas vouches for Paul and his experience he learns from them. Meanwhile, chapter 10, Peter's given a vision of animals in sheets that negates the Jewish food laws, includes everybody. Cornelius also has this vision, and they are all baptized and come to the message, the way, the experience of the filling of the Spirit, and the whole household, everyone is baptized and saved. 10 chapters of Acts. In summary, the gospel, my friends, the gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. The gospel goes somewhere, it does something, and the gospel is the good news of God's grace through Jesus that is for everyone. You, me, these people today, thousands of years ago, this is what the message that we hold, the the message that dwells within us, the spirit that enlivens and emboldens and fills us. This is the good news That is the hallmark and the calling of our lives together as believers, imitators, followers, representatives, little Jesuses together, together. The gospel is good news. The gospel goes, the gospel is grace. Chapter 11, soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles uh had received the word or or, uh, the, the teaching, the message of God. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him or they confronted him. They, they weren't sure what they had heard, whether it was true and why would Peter ever do this? So the Jewish um, believers, the church who are now following the way but had Jewish roots, questioned and criticized Peter. You entered the home of Gentiles and you even ate with them, they said. Then Peter told them exactly what had happened in chapter 10, which we just covered in about seven seconds. I was in the town of Joppa, he said, and while I was praying, I went into a trance and I saw a vision. Something like a large sheet or a sail was let down by its four corners from the sky, which is a, um, it's a, it's a visual representation of the message and the mode, the mission of God uh, that would have been mildly familiar, the sheet sail um, image to Peter. A large sheet was let down by its four corners from the sky and it came right down to me. And when I looked inside this, the sheet, I saw all sorts of tame and wild animals, reptiles and birds. And I heard a voice say, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. Peter knows who this is that's speaking. He names the, the, the auditory voice and he assumes, uh, as we'll read in the text, that this is like a test. He's being tested. No, no, Lord, I replied. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or uh, common or unclean. But the voice from heaven spoke again, do not call something unclean or common if God has made it clean or holy. This happened three times before the sheet was um, all contained and pulled back into heaven. Now remember this rhythm of three, what has Peter experienced uh, as a judgment on himself three times. This is the undoing of the sin and the inclusion of grace that God is messaging and then inviting Peter to invite others in to. I heard this um, message three times before the sheet and all that it contained was pulled back uh, up into heaven. Just then, three men who had been sent from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were staying and the Holy Spirit told me to go with them and not to worry that they were Gentiles. These six brothers here accompanied me and we soon entered the home of the man who had sent for us. He told us how an angel had appeared to him in his home and had told him, send messengers to Joppa and summon a man called Simon Peter. He will tell you how um, you and everyone in your household can be saved or invited into eternal life. As I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell 
on them, dwelled within them, just as he fell on us at the beginning of this whole thing. And then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in the way? And when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, well, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the the privilege of repenting of their sins and, and receiving the way or receiving eternal life or life to the fullest. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, the message of God, not only to the Jews, however, some of the believers, uh, sorry, only to the Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus and the power of the Lord was with them. And a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. When the church at Jerusalem had heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith. And many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul or Paul. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year. For a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And here it is, holy smokes. It was Antioch, at Antioch, in Antioch, that the believers were first called Christians. Okay, okay. This this is a big, big deal. Part of the reason that we are all uh, sitting here or or, um, part of one of our sites listening in, uh, part of the reason that we are experiencing what we're experiencing tonight through the written text and the enlivened word, the spirit of God, is because of this movement of these believers to the north of Jerusalem in a far off city named Antioch. It is the first fully Gentile, non-Jew church, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. Okay, so this begins with evangelism for everyone. Evangelism, Galion is the taking out of, the sharing of the good news of Jesus to anybody and everybody. The sharing of the good news to anybody and everybody as the spirit sees fit. Okay, so what's happened here If you remember from chapter 10, um, Peter gives his own recap here. He gets back to the Jerusalem gathered believers who are likely still reeling uh, after their experience at Pentecost, but it's been years now. It's been years now. They're trying to form together. They're likely still going through the process of like, what does it mean to be a gathered body, an ecclesia, a church, a, a called out gathered body that not only understands the love of God, but is willing to embody the love of God in the known world, to, to, to learn and to serve, to listen and to do. So Peter returns home after his time with Cornelius, something that he did not see coming. Uh, And the believers are not happy that he's been in a Gentile home and dined with Gentile people, much less invited these Gentile people into the way of Jesus. Peter recaps the story, probably anticipating their disdain. Now it's important to note there that this is not arbitrary. These Jewish food laws were like one of the issues. Food laws, cleanliness, and circumcision were the religious issues of the day. Now, food in particular was uh, the offshoot, the byproduct, the fruit of your work in the ground, right? So there's no banking systems. It's an agrarian culture that Jesus is speaking, living into, and that the spirit is emboldening these people through. And so the the fruit of your fields um, showed the blessing, the provision of God. You have food to eat because God has provided it for you. Give us today, Lord, our daily bread. Give us what we need today. All food comes from you. And so this was a marker of the covenant relationship that Yahweh had with his people that Jesus now has with his people. Food was a provision. Um, And in that covenant economy, there were also things that were set apart or set aside. Please don't eat. Not just so that you will stay pure and clean, but so that the world will see that you are set apart. You're different. You don't eat these things. You do eat these things. And this will be part of the measure of your covenant with God. And now this physical symbol has changed that the whole thing is good news right down to the very food that they eat. The the angel of of the Lord or Jesus himself, we're not told who it is, but a voice from heaven that Peter calls Lord says, do not call unclean or common or unholy what I have called clean, holy, 
good, not just food, but now the people. Now the people, think about that. It's not just the food that they've ingested, it's actually the people who are eating the food. Not them either, Peter. Not them either. Not only will you dine with them, but you will invite them into this new way. Not just the food, but the people. And the believers are likely concerned with, not just like, well, the ceremonial food, food laws is one thing, but like our unspoken rules are that we just don't dine with these people. We don't do it. We'll be polluted. Like, why would you sit and dine with them? What is the fruit? And likely Peter is anticipating this and he reminds them of the fruit of this experience. First of all, their obedience, their experience of hearing from the angel of the Lord, their reception, their receiving of the word, the message, the meal of Jesus, the filling of the spirit. And then do you remember the last thing? What happens in Cornelius' home? It rhymes with schmaptized. They're baptized. That's a huge deal, my friends. Think about how long it takes us in one of our local services to baptize a person and hear their story. Now imagine not just the family of these people, but Cornelius is in charge of a guard of people, likely more than a hundred. And all of them, including his family, get baptized. They've listened, they've heard, they've received, they've participated, they're filled with the spirit and they are getting dunked because the gospel does something. The gospel is good news and these people have received it. Verse 17, it seems that God shows no favoritism, Peter says. Why would I stand in the way? All of the evidence is here. It seems that God is gracing these people with the gift of the spirit and the invitation to this new covenant. Verse 18, when they heard this, the the Jewish believers who are still in Jerusalem, when they heard this, they were furious. Nope, they were silent. And then they worshiped God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance, the way that leads to eternal life. My friends, the gospel is good news. The gospel goes somewhere and the gospel is grace. And now we switch gears. Um, It's this wonderful, terrible, wonderful rhythm that's indicative of most of our lives of like, man, really good times. And then it's like, a gear shifts of just like tanking and be like, God, it was going so good. We had a birthday party and then somebody dies. We had a celebration and now somebody is put in jail. We had like the body of Christ shared with us and now we're suffering in our physical bodies. There's this continual wave of pressure and the believers now aren't as safe as they once were in the city of Jerusalem, the city of God, the dwelling place where God makes his home. But now God makes his home, his temple in the individuals and it starts to go viral. It starts to leak. Now, the earliest apostles, they, they don't share anything yet. So you'll notice in the text, they aren't moving anywhere yet, but somehow um, Luke makes mention of the word or the disciples, the believers started to share and it started to travel. It started to get out to the east, to the west, um, to, it went by boat and then it went super far north, essentially the, the Canada of the ancient Near Eastern world to Antioch. Yet, the inner cir- circle is still staying put in Jerusalem. It's phenomenal. God is like, if you won't go, others will. Like this message will not be contained. It is reaching as far as Antioch. It is reaching as far into the world of thousands of years later in a, a Northern province or country called Canada with a bunch of strange believers here in a dimly lit room or in a, a rental facility, wherever you're watching this from, the gospel goes some where even if we're choosing to not quite listen and stay put. Okay, Antioch is a fascinating example, a fascinating metropolis that um, Luke uh, makes a point of uh, highlighting and focusing in on. Now, um, Antioch was, it was a Greek Gentile dominated city, uh, really not much of a Jewish uh, remnant or presence there. Uh, It was controlled by Rome and it was um, a a very, very large city and it was uh, um, bound by religious pluralism. So there were a number of different gods. There was the influence of uh, Diana and Artemis. Um, So you worshiped what you wanted, like whatever you grew up with, all good, whatever you wanna believe in, all good. So long as you you pay homage to and submit to at the end of the day, Caesar, which was Claudius at the time of this writing, who called himself a son of God. There were also some pretty loose sexual uh, and societal um, morals. So again, this is a pluralistic society of like, ah, we're figuring it out. We'll just, you know, double, triple dip, whatever we feel goes, goes. And the message of Jesus reaches this city and mass conversion takes over with a great number of believers, verse 21, believing in and following Jesus. Not just believing in, but doing what? Following 
This is a big deal, my friends. We should not miss verse 21. We should not miss verse 21. Not just philosophical assent, which we've talked about before. This isn't just like a heart confession. It's their bodies acted out what their hearts had confessed. The believers believed in, received the message, and then did what it said. And the message takes over this city, the Toronto, New York, Berlin, Paris, wherever, you, uh, huge city that you can name. The whole city is taken over by this absolutely inclusive, grace-oriented, wonderful event evangelistic message of Jesus that includes them. And who does this happen with? No one, no pastors, no leaders, no deacons. No pastors, no leaders, no boards, no deacons. The message, the spirit, this movement, and now church. It's just a gathering that's growing like crazy because they have experienced the, the life-giving message of the risen Christ that now includes them. And this church is growing like crazy. This is now the first instance in the New Testament. This is the first instance and in confirmation of a large, growing, fully Gentile church. Imagine, that's us. That's us. This is a non-Jewish city. This is a non-Jewish church. A fully Gentile church is like, oh my goodness, we are captured by this. We're all in. We're all in. Imagine, imagine the first Gentile church. The late um, Dr. F.F. Bruce, who I've um, followed his work for many years, he's uh, passed away, but he's the uh, professor, uh, professor of biblical criticism and exegesis at the University of Manchester. Uh, he, he wrote on Acts chapter 11. This is what he says. It, it's brilliant. But now a new chapter in the city's history was now to begin for Antioch was about to become the major metropolis of Gentile Christianity. The major metropolis of Gentile Christianity, the power of God now manifest in the conversion of many Gentiles in this time, this city, and this place. An Ethiopian eunuch might have become a Christian sometime previously while sitting in his covered wagon at the Gaza Road and a Roman centurion in his household, household might have believed the gospel in his home at Caesarea as an apostle unfolded it to them. But the scale and scope of Gentile evangelization in Antioch was something entirely new and was evidently taking over the Gentile world. The ancient world was becoming convinced of the message of Jesus outside the synagogue, the temple, and the church. If that doesn't get an amen, I don't know what will. The gospel, my friends, is good news. The gospel goes and the gospel is grace. The gospel is good news. It's good news, liberating, freeing, empowering news. The gospel goes and does something. It changes us. And then the gospel is grace. Uh, verse 25 and 26, another fascinating thing that I think I missed the first time I read it. Verse 25 and 26. Then Barnabas um, he, he went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he, he brought him back to Antioch. Um, both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And it was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Okay, this is fascinating. So Barnabas is sent, they hear um, the viral sensation that is this Antiochian church that is now empowered by the spirit and is growing like crazy. They send a delegation, likely Barnabas, like they chose a Quincy, right? Like that gentle encourager, wise counsel. If you don't know who Quincy is, look him up. Um, uh, go and care for, see what's going on. Uh, and you know, probably like it's nuanced there, probably correct them if they're a little bit off in some of their rules, but do it gently like only Quincy would. And Barnabas goes, the great encourager, he goes and he is overwhelmed with joy. No corrections, no rules, no ritual, rituals. He is overwhelmed with joy. And then he takes it upon himself to go and do what? Did you notice? He's like, holy smokes, that's the Greek. I, I don't, I, I can't do this by myself. Uh, where's that dude? Where's that dude that was once killing us not too long ago? He seems to have a message that connects with the Gentiles. I will go and get him. Travels quite a distance. This isn't like a, a short walk across the street in Oakville. This is a planned venture. It says, just chill Antioch. Well, you won't. Just keep growing Antioch. I'll go and get Saul from Tarsus, soon to be renamed Paul, his Greek name. They come back and they don't just visit and write like a... Um, a spiritual guide handbook or a church policy handbook or elect a few boards or subcommittees. No, they stay, they live there for a year, guiding, teaching, shepherding, and caring for them. And it was in Antioch, Luke records, that the, the word Christian first makes its like, 
bubbles up into the air. Now, there's two definitions. There was a uh, there's a good ancient historical reference to um, the Romans, in particular, using coining the word Christian as a pejorative connotation. It's like little Jesus imitators. Like these are the little Jesuses. So we see this in the third and fourth century. But in Antioch, this was more of a definitive, like inside out participation in the gospel. So it's partisans, participate participants, imitators of and little Jesuses. This is where this terminology first comes from, and that we now have a spiritual legacy for. We call ourselves Christians because this group first found themselves participating in, imitating, uh, and reflecting the teaching, the mission, the way, the person, the love, the ethic of Jesus, not just through a religious gathering, not just through a country club uh, sign up or membership, not just ceremony and group think, but a new way that includes everyone through grace, even Gentiles. This, my brothers and sisters, is our spiritual genealogy. We are reading our story when we read their story. The gospel is good news. The gospel goes somewhere and the gospel is grace. Okay, so it just gets better and better, except that it doesn't. Chapter 12 is like this strange diabolical twist, this dive off of a cliff cliff where we hear about Herod Agrippa or King Herod who hates what is happening. He hates these new believers, both in Jerusalem and outside of it, because they threaten his kingdom and they threaten his well-formed and ancient sense of religiosity where only a few people get in and we follow these rules because that seems to be what makes God happy. And I will do anything that I can to stop this new movement or at least belittle it. We read even in passing, and this just shows like the Lucan economy, the Jesus economy, that uh, the beginning of chapter 12 is like, oh, BTW, by the way, um, James is killed by the sword, chopped up, uh, and then uh, Peter is, uh, is, is jailed. That was how it starts. Like no ceremony, she's like, yeah, this is what we signed up for. Like, of course there's gonna be suffering. God is taking over the world. There's bound to be some casualties. So Herod um, petitions for and exacts execution on James, the brother of John, and then he arrests Peter. And Peter, once again, though, he's um, chained up by four times four. We're not really sure what that means. It's eight to 12 guards who he's chained to right? You, homie, you are not going anywhere. You are staying put in the dark. And this isn't like our correctional facilities today where it's three meals a day and outside yard time. You're chained in a dungeon in the dark. And there's four people, 12 people, 16 people, however many attached to you. So you do not get away. And what happens? Peter gets away. Why? An angelic appearance who sets this person physically, emotionally, spiritually free. This is an indicator of what's happening in the unseen world. God is setting people th- free through the good news of Jesus. And what happens? Does Peter go and hide? Nope. Returns to the community and says, let's get back at the work. Whatever. Let's keep going. And then Rhoda, if you know the story, uh, she's a a follower of Jesus and she's like one of the servants that, um, you know, helps to keep the home where the disciples, the the group is is gathering. Rhoda goes to the door, sees it's Peter and is like, oh my gosh, closes the door, runs back, tells everybody. And Peter's like, oh dear Lord, I mean, I just got set free by, can you please just open the door and we'll celebrate once I get inside. (laughs) So he gets in and the gospel continues to spread. If anything, this would be, this should be the end of the story. You're chained to a bunch of guards and yet, we serve a God of freedom who frees us up to serve and to care for the world, to love God with our whole being and love others as we love ourselves. Despite ongoing struggles and bumps and bruises, suffering, persecution, the good news of the way of Jesus continues to capture the hearts and the souls, the minds, the bodies, the philosophies of those who've always been far from God, who've never been included in this. Those who have always thought that God looked, sounded, acted, and taught a certain way, but my, oh my, how things are changing. Chapter 12, verse uh, 24. Meanwhile, the word, the message, the move of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers in Antioch. My friends, this is our lineage, our genealogy, our spiritual heritage, the same message to us today. The gospel is good news. The gospel goes somewhere and the gospel is grace. And so if you found yourself struggling, if you found yourself um, burdened by the weight of religion or religious rules that are feeling just too heavy to carry, my friends, may you be reminded, may we be reminded that the gospel frees us up, does not weigh us down. The gospel is good 
news. If you found yourself feeling stuck, slowed down by the daily tasks of life, uh, the, the monotony, monotony of, of a job that just seems like boring and defeating or, or the tragedy ongoing that is happening in the world, wondering what God is doing. My friends, may we be reminded that the gospel is good news that goes and frees people, that cares from people. The gospel goes and does something. It motivates us. It goes. It doesn't just have us thinking. It has its doing. And if you find yourself wondering That sounds crazy. It sounds too good to be true. Like, could God love me this much? Could I, could we be a part of this? The answer is yes. Yes. This is our story. This is where we came from. The gospel is grace. It includes, it frees up, it unchains, it unlocks. It includes you, me, our whole lives, living examples, little Jesuses, imitators of Jesus, participating in the new way of life, reflecting and responding to his will and to his way so that everybody can hear. The gospel is good news. The gospel goes and the gospel is grace. I want to end our time with a beautiful benediction. Uh, Dr. John Birch, who's a contemporary Methodist theologian in the UK, uh, reflecting on the path of the early disciples and apostles, he writes this benediction, and with this we'll close. May it bless you as it has me. So brothers and sisters, may God the Father prepare your journey. May Jesus the Son guide your footsteps. May the spirit of life strengthen your body. May the three-in-one watch over you on every road that you may follow. And we've received these things and together we all said, Amen. 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 Okay, I'll give us a minute to breathe. For those of you that, uh, what's that? For me to breathe. Yeah. (laughs) That was like a four hour lecture in <laughs> 32 minutes. <laughs> yeah, Rob. Okay, Jimmy, here's the challenge. Okay. 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us the gospel? Can I tell us the gospel? And if it takes a little longer, that's okay. Uh, 60 seconds. Um, that God is creator, mother, father, spirit, that God loves his creation, did everything he can to create it, embolden it, save it, that Jesus came to earth to show us what a human life of thriving love and grace looks like, and that the spirit empowers empowers us to to share this message uh, with each other and others so that many, as many people are included in this life as possible. And at the other end of eternity, we will experience union perfection, the fullness of a loving relationship with the divine. So if you're going to translate that, yep. if you're going to translate that into yep. early times, like yep. right, at, right around the time we're talking, yeah. do you think that's what they'd be saying to the the, uh, oh yeah, no, really good. Yes and no. First uh, Corinthians fifteen um, three, which is the earliest. Is that right, Paul? I'm looking at you. Fifteen three. Yes, it's the earliest creedal definition of. So uh, again, context is everything, right? So if I just said that to an ancient, um, very impoverished, newly new convert to the Jesus way, they'd be like. Or to a gentile. Who or to a gentile, they'd be like. I'm like an Antioch. Yeah, they'd be like, who is this guy? Let's stone him. Um, not actually. What would they have said? The, the believers would have said, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord and Savior, not Caesar. Not Caesar, not Rome. The way to, to lead is to care and to serve. Uh, the, the way to participate in the work of Jesus is to suffer and die. Take up your cross, follow. This is what we signed up for, and it's the better way to live. And what's in it for them? Because they always ask that. What's in it for me? Uh, Interestingly, only the religious people really tended to ask that. It's like, what do I have to do to get the things that I want? The the poorest of the poor and the Gentiles are like, we'll take whatever we can get. There's a story of a woman uh, who who comes to the table. uh, It's in... um, Mark 7, I believe. It's this, uh, the children's bread. You've probably heard of it before. So she's at the table and Jesus uses, uh, some scholars would say Jesus is like indicative of like a really hyper, um, almost bigoted religious subculture that says there's definitely these people are, are that are out. I would not 
affirm that, I would say Jesus is using a lesson to show his disciples this better way. So she comes uh, and asks Jesus for like, hey, how, do, how, do, how can I participate in this? And then Jesus responds to her, it's not right to give um, food to the dogs, right? Which is what uh, the Jewish people in particular called the Gentiles. These are the dogs, in particular the, Samar the Samaritans. These are the outcasts. We have nothing to do with them. I won't give anything to you. And then she retorts. The fact that Jesus gives a woman office is fascinating to, to talk to him. And she says, yes, but even, even like the master allows like the, the dog or the pet. So Jesus is using, it's transferring to now a pet analogy um, to, to eat the crumbs. And what does Jesus say? Okay, you got me. <laughs> Gives her the guns. He's like, that was good, that was good. He says, this woman's faith, nowhere in Israel has anybody's faith been so great. She's in like that, that's it, that's it. Doesn't baptize her, but she's included in this way of faith. So I think the lowest of the low um, man, they're, they're just like, whatever we can get, we'll take. Like you're saying this new kingdom way includes us. That's, that's crazy, you know? I think the, the harder message was for the religious people. It was for the people who were um, trained, bent, convinced on their own semblance of religiosity that they struggled to hear the message of Jesus. And lest we think that's just the outsiders and the Sanhedrin, it's also the apostles, you know? Um, I've shared this story before, uh, in Matthew's gospel, um, n nearing the crucifixion, uh, a couple moms come to Jesus and they're like, could you make sure our boys are on your left and they're good boys, you know, make sure. Position of power, left and right, we went there. And Jesus is like, <laughs> okay, it's death. Like, that's what we're leading towards. So you don't know what you're asking for. And it's also not up to me. Like, the, the, the father decides that. Uh, but, I mean, we're gonna suffer and die. Like that's the new way that this is going. The, the people that have struggled with pain and poverty, we're going to enter into their story, care for them, and we're gonna be like a spiritual hospital for those that are dying and suffering. This is the way, the methodology, the message of Jesus. And then fascinatingly, it, uh, it evolves um, over time. So the gospel is always tailored, uh, is centered on Jesus, but tailored to the audience. So in um, Acts, I'm giving away later sermons. No, I'm gonna stop there. There's certain, listen to the rest of the series. It's going to be really good. Um, for those of you that are online, I'm sorry I haven't been paying, paying attention to the chat. Uh, for those of you in the room, if you want to start thinking of a few more questions, if you have them, I will take a look at the chat right now. Just a lot of haze in the chat. <laughs> Oh, sorry, nope, that's my bad, I didn't. It's user error. Um, any other questions from the room? Anything you wanna bring me back to? I think it's fascinating how uh, there are story after story of God using people and people not feeling confident or strong or willing, however that goes, yeah. to do the work that's being asked but yet still the spirit goes yep. and fills it beautiful. Yeah, and the propensity sometimes of like the most well-meaning or mal-weaning um, <laughs> Christians to just like stay put and philosophize until it becomes yeah. abundantly clear, you know? And not go, but still yeah. the spirit goes. Yeah, and, and you can understand like they were they're gonna get killed. They're all very fearful. Jesus gives them a very clear command though. He's like, stay here, stay here in Jerusalem. And then when the spirit uh, comes upon you, you'll be empowered to do all these things. And then we read at least seven to 10 years later, they're still like, it's nice in the upper room. We'll just stay here for a bit. And yet the message still continues until like really uh, Barnabas and Saul, Paul are the ones who are like, do you guys know what's happening in Canada? Like, this is crazy. This is crazy. We gotta, we gotta follow where the message is leading. It's, it's, it's happening. It's happening. So let's get out there. And then they do. Then they do. Then they start moving, which we'll see um, uh, in, the rest of the, uh, in the rest of the book. Lisa says, the thing is, I don't want to suffer and die. Doesn't sound <laughs> like good news. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. And I wouldn't say, thanks, Lisa, that's a great um, clarifying point. That's not the only emblem of uh, 
of the work of the gospel. So it is not, like, that's not what the t-shirt is, is like, hey, come to the meeting house, we will kill you, you'll suffer and die. <laughs> no, um, but it is, it's, it's a gut and, and an, uh, it's an ego check. You know, if we adhere to the message of Jesus because we want health, wealth, prosperity, to be taller, faster, cooler, whatever, it's, we've missed it, we've missed it. You know, it's not just a matter of God, grant me all the things that I want and need so that I can go through life with safe passage. No, 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 no. It's God, grant me all the things that I need to be the most loving version of myself that includes people into the love of God in their daily lives. And that likely, Lisa, will include suffering because no longer are you just focused on your own semblance of um, um, self-preservation right? You're no longer living for yourself, that I'm just safe and I've got my warm bed at night and enough zeros in the bank. You know, it's actually a moving out and saying, I'll do whatever I can to help as many people as I can understand uh, the love and experience the love of God as possible. It's hard to have empathy if you have never experienced uh, any of the pain. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Question here, question here, and then question here. One, two, three. Yep. I noticed that you said that God was making his home in Jerusalem. Mm. And then after that, um, God was making his home in hearts. In people, yeah. And it was when he was making his home in people's hearts, that's when Christianity started to grow. Yeah. Yeah, we don't need um, a brick and mortar temple to look at to say, oh, right, that's where God lives. I live over here but that's where God lives and sort of like this, like the, we are the new temples. In fact, the, the temple that they were uh, accustomed to was destroyed, Jesus predicted it, you know? So yeah, it's, it's the, we are the dwelling place, the temple of the living God by the spirit, yep. Just a clarification, did you say it was years after Pentecost? Uh, the, the mission of Antioch? Yeah. We don't know for sure. Um, I would contend that Luke adds um, the reign of Claudius, which is, Right, so that's probably seven to 10 years after Jesus. So it's likely in the 40s. The compilation of the Gospel of Luke is likely in the second century. I would suggest, and I'm not an ancient historian, but um, in reading um, some of the scholarly work, it seems like the writing of the Gospel of Luke Acts, the two volumes, is is late first century, early second century, which by the way isn't a threat. This is an historian physician who's looking back and being like, Oh wow, okay, we're here. We see the results in fruit and the stories that have been shared across the globe as they knew it. Let's trace back as to how we got here, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yep, Paul? Yeah, <clears throat> that question that was asked, that's a very good question. The suffering one, I don't want to die. <clears throat> but I think we have to take the gospel a bit further. I think we all understand that Jesus loves me. Yep, there's a song about it. That's right. But we also got to understand that Jesus loves you, Yeah. right? And it is the you that we need to be able to express in the going. I like what you said, that the church has been sent out, yeah. right? So the message is good to understand that we're precious in his sight. Yeah. But even our enemies are even that much more precious. And he needs us now to risk our neck, yeah. right? Yep. So sometimes we take the good news very selfishly because there is a price to pay yeah. to yep. follow him, right? Really good. Like, I mean, you know, that's, uh, Jesus explained that. He says, greater love has no one. Then how do they know that we belong to him? Yep. It's in the very thing that we are supposed to display what he displayed. Right. So, really good. that is great news. Yep, really good. Now you got to die. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to death. Yeah. <laughs> um, Brenda, I'm just going to read your question. What was happening in Acts was new, But now in our time, it seems like the gospel needs a revival. Yeah, totally. I I should read it. Needs a revival in places that have uh, have heard but have fallen away. Does the methodology of going change from the early churches going as uh, compared to our current day need to reignite the gospel message? Yeah, what a great question. Absolutely. Like I said, I think the gospel, the work of the gospel or the, um, the sharing, the evangelization of the gospel uh, context matters, you know what I mean? Like, um, growing up, my parents had no religious background. Uh, they were converted through suffering because of like an old, like very conservative um, 
church that reached out to them in the way that they needed, which was not good teaching, because we didn't have it, which was not good music or kids programs. It was like a care ministry that was like, your daughter passed, your daughter died. We will care for you. And my parents were like, if that's what this is like, count me in. Why don't more people know about this? You know, whereas as my parents evolved, um, my mom especially is uh, much more artsy, and uh, I don't mean that in a pejorative way, is more um, Pentecostal uh, in spirit. Uh, and so that evolved for her, and I would say like her sharing of the good news, the gospel, is, is, um, is different. For me, I have a heart for um, the, like, the, the tattoo community. I didn't grow up with tattoos. I was never interested in it. I had a friend who got one, and then I got into a random conversation with a tattoo artist who had never heard anything good news coming from a church person's mouth, and I was like, I'm going to start getting tattoos. Like, this is the mission field. This is people who have, are, look a certain way and are ostracized by the evangelical church, the, the evangelical church that doesn't evangelize these people. Um, I've shared it before, once I got like my shoulder tattoo, um, like, have I shared this before? I haven't heard it. Oh, I'll say it really quickly. So I'm in, uh, the, the tattoo on my shoulder is like a, an ancient depiction of heaven and hell. It's really, really cool. It's not like demonic or scary. It's just this like melding. It's the turning of the world. Really, really cool. So my buddy, Mike, who I'd met at a tattoo shop, this is that first guy. Um, he's like, we had never had the like, so you're a pastor, right? Cause that shuts down a convo real quick. So he starts tattooing, he's like, what is this? He's like, it's really cool. I'm like, oh, it's actually an ancient painting by this artist who is a theologian and it's about heaven and hell. And he's like, so God stuff? Yeah, Zzz. huh, I'm like, oh Lord, I already <laughs> paid for this, so what's gonna happen? You know, and he keeps going uh, and it's just quiet. And he's like, so like, you're, you're a pastor. Yep, like a priest, sure, yep. And so it's just this like gentle unfolding of like, I don't get this world. What are you doing here? Do your church people know that you're getting a tattoo? They didn't. Um, and then he was just like peppering me with questions and questions and questions and questions that I was locked and loaded and knocking it out of the park. No word of an exaggeration. By the time that that, ta we closed the shops. This is a large shop in Edmonton. Um, there was probably 20 people in my little room and I'm just like, pew, 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 question, 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 question. And then Mike killed the room and said, this is amazing. Like you've single-handedly rescued my opinion of Christians. So if we came to your church, would we be able to have a conversation like this? And my answer was no. I was part of a very conservative church at the time, and I know for a fact that if a guy like Mike walked in sounding and looking the way that he did, he would be met at the back by some elders being like, are you lost? You know, maybe you wanna, you know? And so he just was like, see, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter what you say, it matters what you do. And everybody left the room. And I just remember being so grieved where I was like, I have nothing to say to that, he's right, you know? So what's my part? What's my contextual evangelization? Um, it's to reach people and to be a voice for people and to better understand people like this that are not like me. And I guess start getting tattooed. So much to my parents' chagrin, so. There's a good book, Jim, read it. It's called Once You See by Jeff Christopherson. Mm. It's a really good book. It yeah. talks about exactly what you just said. The contextualization of evangelism, yeah. Acts 18 is another great example. Mm -hmm. Which we'll get to. All right. I guess with the tattoos, you took that whole uh, Romans five thing seriously about suffering and glorying in it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yep, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I'm suffering with Jesus. <laughs> tattoos. All right, maybe that feels like a good place to to park things. Thanks for your engagement, friends. As I'm sure you could tell, I was super amped to preach, participate in this. The gospel is good news. It goes places, and it's grace. Grace and peace to all of you. And to those of you online, grace and peace. Thanks for hanging out.